Hi guys, I decided to make another video um, for the lecture examples that I included for review uh, to go over how we run these tests um, and then further to integrate how we use our decision trees and the flowcharts to help with the outputs. So um, just to review real quick, that was the wrong one. Um, we've kind of covered the majority of this side of uh, our statistical test so far. So this week we looked at ANOVAs, specifically one-way, uh, simple or independent sample ANOVAs, and we also looked at repeated measures ANOVAs. So in both of these uh, types of tests, we're going to have a pair, one parametric dependent variable, one non-parametric independent variable, and then within that given independent variable, we have three or more levels. So with the t-test, we had two levels, right, pre-test, post-test, or if you're looking at two different um, uh, interventions at the same time, right, but in either case, you were comparing two samples. In ANOVA, we're going to be comparing three samples. So if you have a between-subject design, we go with a one-way ANOVA where all of the people within the samples are going to be different sample to sample. If you have a within-subject design, we use a repeated measures ANOVA, which is telling us that the same subjects have been recycled for each sample or grouping uh, that goes along with our independent variable. Additionally, we always are going to have a normal uh, distribution and random sampling. And then the major difference between a one-way or a simple one-way and a repeated measures one-way is the assumption that has to be met. So a regular independent sample one-way ANOVA has to meet the assumption of homogeneity of variance, very similar to an independent t-test like we ran last week. And the evaluating test is going to be exactly the same. So um, that's nice because you already know what the null hypothesis is for Levine's test or for the homogeneity of variance assumption. So it's going to be exactly the same in the case of an ANOVA, instead of two variables or two variances that you're comparing, you're comparing three or more because each variance belongs to a given sample and we have three or more samples or groupings in a um, ANOVA setup. Okay, this is going to um, change, right, or this assumption will change if we're looking at a repeated measures ANOVA where we have to meet the assumption of sphericity. We test this with Mochley's test, and um, there are certain correction factors um, similar to a correction factor, right, if we don't meet either one of these assumptions. So um, purpose of this video is to kind of go through, right, we know we're going to be working with ANOVAs, but kind of going through further how to read them and, and what to do with the data when we see it in a spreadsheet like this. Okay, so oftentimes um, in your guys' activities, I give you numbers, right, and they're categorized if uh, we have a nominal type data, which in ANOVAs we do. So our example in this case is that um, researchers are trying to see if there are any differences in the accelerations that football players of different ages tend to see with the same kind of hits. So using accelerometers in the helmets, they got the following information. Okay, so from this uh, statement, we should be able to see that accelerations okay, are going to be our dependent variable and our independent variable is basically age or play level, right? So we've further categorized individuals into peewee, high school, college, and professional. And then we would collect e these numbers, right, are going to be representing the acceleration data that we get from the accelerometers and the helmets. So I think it's pretty obvious that we can assume peewee players are not going to be repeated in any of these other columns, right? Professionals aren't going 
to match with high schoolers. Okay, so these are, it's fairly easy to figure out that these are independent samples or that each sample is only collected one time. So if you remember when we look in SPSS, in our data view, right, each number or each row represents a single subject and then each column represents uh, a different variable per se. So in this case we can reorganize our data and this is something that you'll start to notice a pattern of whenever you have independent samples you usually are going to have to reorganize your data in some way. If you have uh, repeated measures or a paired sample Usually, however I give you the data can go into SPSS as is, but as it is right now, if we just copied and pasted this, right, each row would look like, oh, this is subject one, and subject one has four measurements, which we know is not true in, in this given scenario. So um, basically what we have to do is we have to give age a label, right? And then in this side, we can say these are the um, accelerations that were measured. So independent variable, dependent variable. Okay. By age, we have peewee values. Okay. And let's just say that instead of putting peewee, we're going to say all of these get a data label of one. Similarly for high school, right, we're kind of just stacking our data, and we've done this before. So it should, the process should seem kind of familiar. Okay, but we just make this huge column, oops, sorry, make this huge column where each of our original columns is just associated with a certain data label or numerical value. I'm just going to click that so it stops flashing because that's going to bother me. Okay, so now we've got accelerations and their uh, data labels. Okay, so what we can do is we can copy this and stick it into our SPSS spreadsheet. Okay, we know automatically these are going to be inserted as scale or ratio data. So we just have to define age as nominal because it represents categories, and then our accelerations are going to be scale. Okay, in addition, we have to add what our values are. So we know that one was peewee. Two was high school. I'm just going to put HS. Three was college. And four represented pro or professional. Okay, so that way um, SPSS knows that these values aren't necessarily numbers that were collected as far as quantifiable data, but rather they're categorical values that represent. Um, how we divided our, our total sample. So from here, this is where I'm going to try to do this nicely. We can go with our output, right? So I'm going to keep this on the side. That way we can follow along as we go. But generally, once we have our information in, we can go straight to our analysis. So we're still comparing means for a one-way ANOVA, okay? And then it, it'll be the last test in here. The only one that we have not used in this section is the summary independent samples t-test. Um, but other than that, you guys have worked with every single one of these so far, okay? So if we click on one-way ANOVA, there's going to be a dependent list and a factor. Those should sound relatively intuitive, right? Dependent list referring to the dependent variable, which is our acceleration data, and the factor by which you're dividing that acceleration data, which is by age. Just in case we get a significant effect, 
we need to have post hoc tests ready to analyze. In our class, remember we said in lecture that we use two keys post hoc tests um, with equal variances assumed. Okay. Additionally, if you go into options, descriptive statistics are going to be our mean and standard deviation stuff. That's always good to have a reference to. We also need the homogeneity of variance test, so this will be Levine's test. Um, that'll let us know if we've met our assumption, right? And if we don't meet our assumption, we need an additional correction factor, which is going to show up in Welch's test. So this is our alternative if homogeneity of variance is um, violated, pretty much. Okay, so we can click continue, press OK, and then we'll get an output. Um, and I'm just going to call this one football. That way I know what I'm looking at. Okay, but generally this is what comes out. Okay, so you can see from the top um, we've got our descriptive statistics for each of our groups, similar to what we would have seen in a means analysis earlier in the semester. We have our test for homogeneity of variance, so we have Levine statistic as well as the p-values for that homogeneity test. We have our ANOVA table, which is very similar to the table that I gave you guys in lecture this week. And then we have our robust tests of equality of means, which is where Welch's correction factor comes into play. Okay. Um, additionally, we have our pairwise comparisons, or you can see our two key uh, post hoc tests. So these are going to be the pairs um, or basically mini t tests that we have. And then you should uh, see the p values for each of those pairwise comparisons to figure out if you have significant differences between each pair. As for down here, we kind of ignore this last table. So primarily what you're interested in is the test for homogeneity of variance, the ANOVA table, the Welch's uh, test if applicable, and then we have our post hoc tests. Okay, so what do we start with? Because this is starting to get a little bit more complex than what we had last week. Okay, the first thing we have to look at is our assumption test. So in order to accept the results of the ANOVA output, we have to know that we've met this assumption, and if we have not, we need to be able to correct for it. So in a, a test for homogeneity of variance, our null hypothesis is that we're saying each sample should have relatively equal variance, or the variability that exists within each sample should be relatively the same. Okay, So Levine's test is going to return a p-value that is evaluating um, this null hypothesis. Right? So if we go to our homogeneity of variance test, Okay, um, I think this might be for just version 25, so if, you're, if yours looks a little bit different, that's okay. You can always just send me a screenshot and I can tell you what we're looking at. But pretty much what we're doing is we're looking at the Levine statistic for um, the mean, right, or based on the mean. So nice and easy, it's the first row, okay? So Levine statistic is evaluated in a specific way, and we get a p-value for that Levine statistic, which is technically our p-value for our test for homogeneity of variance. Okay, so we can see here that we have a p-value of 0 .000, which most of you would say, oh, the p-value or the exact p-value for Levine's test is zero. Now remember, we noted that anytime we see this notation, right, it's a rounding error. Um, or uh, a rounding consideration in SPSS because SPSS only gives us three decimal places. So there could be like 0 0.00000001, right? Because the error can never be an absolute zero. We are humans. We always have some degree of error in our processes, and there's always some degree of error in collecting a sample from a population. So when we see this, we actually say P 
where the exact p-value is going to be less than 0.001. Okay, um, but we can say right off of that p-value, right, if it's less than 0.05, because this Levine's test is um, carried out by a 95% level of confidence, right, which means our alpha is 0.05. If we notice that we are within our confidence interval, right, or that p is greater than 0.05, we would accept that we have equal variances and we could take the results from the ANOVA table. However, in this example, we know that the exact p-value is less than 0 0.001, which definitely is less than 0 0.05, so that tells us we have unequal variances within our sample. Okay, And you should relatively, sometimes it's a little bit obvious um, than other times, but basically, remember, standard deviation is uh, the square root of variance. So if we took the squares of each of these, you could see that variance is going from about 16 all the way up to 64, which is a rather large jump, right? So when you um, don't meet the test for homogeneity variance, or you don't meet that assumption, you can kind of directly link it back to the the degree of variability within your samples, okay? But there's there's a huge process that we don't go into that that um, allows us to get these test results. So, so far all we know is that we don't have equal variances and we need to apply some type of correction factor so that our samples are comparable to each other such that we can accept the results of the output. So this pathway is going to take us to our robust test of equality of means which is our Welch test. Okay. Essentially, the null hypothesis is going to be exactly the same as in a regular ANOVA table. Okay. So because we rejected Levine's test, or we rejected um, that we have equal variances, we skip over the ANOVA table and we jump straight to the Welch test. So the statistic kind of is uh, in a way similar to F. Right, and you can see a statistic with that little superscript A. A is representing an asymp uh, totically F distributed. Okay, so this is basically like your new F ratio or F statistic, and we get an exact p-value for that F statistic. Okay, so in our case we have a p-value of 0.496. When we evaluate the p-value for point four or for uh, Welch, right, 0.496 is definitely um, not, oh, that's interesting. This should be greater than, didn't catch that. Um, in which case we would accept it all, okay? P-value is definitely not less than 0.05, right? 0.496 is greater than 0.05. Therefore, we would accept the null hypothesis and say that there is no significant difference between the means or we don't have, um, uh, in, in the case of age, right, there's no effect of age on acceleration, okay? So um, that would kind of be the stopping point for this example, right? But let's say that for either the Welch's test or the regular ANOVA table, our F ratio was significant, in the case where we would reject the null hypothesis, that's where we would look at our post hoc tests, um, which are located down here. And usually it's pretty easy with the post hoc tests because they'll put little asterisks next to the significant pair, so they're a little bit easier to pull out of the table. But like I said, because we don't have a significant effect, that means relatively all of our means are similar to each other or similar enough that they're not significantly different. And if you look at the actual means of each group, you can kind of see why that is. Okay, so that's our uh, first example, which is our repeated measures. Okay, um, this is going to be a situation where we have the same subjects being measured multiple times. So in this scenario, 
we are looking at different protocols that could be used to calculate a VO2 max. We tested 27 individuals, so you can see 27 data points. Each person was tested with th the three protocols. So in this case, subject 1 should have three uh, VO2 values, subject 10 should have three VO2 values, right? So again, generally, when we have independent samples, we have to create data labels and stack all of our data in one big column. But when we have repeated measures and individuals have been measured multiple times, we can simply copy and paste into Excel, which is super nice because then we don't have to reorganize anything. So let me open a new data set. And we'll go ahead and paste our data into here. Um, know that protocol itself is the independent variable. Okay, but it is categorized into three different protocols. So in this case, each column represents a different grouping of your independent variable. And each um, cell within the data sheet is representing measurements taken of your dependent variable. Okay, so in this case, for uh, repeated measures, ANOVAs, we have to go to a different section. We go to general linear model and then repeated measures. Now, the thing that I, the one complaint that I have about SPSS is that for a repeated measures test, any repeated measures test that we use in this class uses this pathway. So a lot of times in the output, you're gonna get information that you don't necessarily need. Um, when we get in here, we have to indicate what our within subject factor is. So this is the factor that we're using to compare um, the samples multiple times, right? In this case, our independent variable that is um, being used on the same subjects is protocol. And there are three levels of that protocol. So we define that. And that will indicate this section here. So this is indicating the first permutation of our independent variable, second variation, third variation. Okay, so basically protocol one goes into one, protocol two, right? Pretty easy. Don't worry about between subject factors or covariates yet. Okay, if we had between subject factors, we would use this post hoc uh, button. But since we're only working with the within subject variable, we're going to look at estimated marginal means. Okay. Um, some of you might have a slightly different setup if you have an older version. Estimated marginal means as well as the information in the options tab will be clumped together. I think version 25 and onward, which I can't really speak on 26 and 27 because I haven't played with them, but um, I know version 25, which is the one that I use, separates. Um, if, if you're using an older version, just know that these two things are going to be in one table. Okay. So if we look at our estimated marginal means, this is our setup for our pairwise comparisons. So we'll want to put protocol in here, compare main effects, and we're going to use a Bonferroni method as mentioned in the lecture. Okay, so this is how, again, we set up our pairwise comparisons or a post-hoc post test. Under options, this is where um, you can adjust your significance level or your alpha level. Um, we want descriptive statistics as well as estimates of effect size. This tells us how large the difference actually is. I decided this semester to not make you guys calculate the effect size just because uh, I think there's a lot more relevant information for you guys to look at. Okay, um, But you can also see there's a lot of other if we wanted to look at the power of our sample, um, if we wanted to look at homogeneity tests, let's say if we had a between subject factor um, included Right. We have those options in this options tab. So all we are interested for this test is descriptive statistics and estimates of effect size, which are notated on 
um, your introductions in your activity as well as the key terms and concepts page for this module. But we press OK and then we have our example added into here. So I'm going to call this one protocols and you'll see um, protocol labels 1, 2, and 3 represent protocols 1, 2, and 3. Okay, our descriptive statistics are listed here. This first multivariate test, ignore. Okay, so the I think the repeated measures test specifically is where your uh, uh, output flow charts are going to come in handy. So if we take a look at this, it says first stop is Modulus test of sphericity. Okay, so here we are. Right, Mochley's, um value will be indicated for the within subject variable that you're interested in. And if we scroll all the way over to the SIG column, remember anytime you see SIG, we're looking at a p-value. So in this case, our p-value is 0.281. When we evaluate Mochley's test of sphericity, Okay, we're looking at the difference in the variances. Okay, so similar to our one-way ANOVA where I was like, oh, you can kind of look back at your standard deviation, right? Variance is going to be squared, okay, or a standard deviation squared, basically. And um, you can see each of these standard deviations is relatively similar, which is a good thing. Right? But we would basically look at, are the differences between those variances, if we looked at uh, the difference between the variance for protocol 1 and 2, the difference between 2 and 3, the difference between 1 and 3, are those differences in the variances relatively equal? And that tells us if our sample was good at being a repeated measure, such that um, they still represented a similar pattern of growth or change whatever okay so this is uh, essentially kind of a similar process that we see um, when we look at the correlation coefficient in a paired t-test right but because we're working with multiple samples correlations again are only between two variables so it's not necessarily going to work in our favor okay so uh, if we have a p-value of Mochley's test that's greater than 0.05, we say sphericity is assumed, yay, and then we move on to assess our ANOVA. Okay, so in our case, again, Mochley's test is 0.281, which is indeed greater than 0.05, so we can ex uh, accept that we have assumed sphericity, we've met our assumption, right, and we can move on to our main ANOVA table. But let's see, uh, or let's say for some reason we violated sphericity and we had, instead of a, a p-value that was greater than 0.05 in this column, we had a p-value that was less than 0.05. That will tell us to look at epsilon. Okay, we always start in the greenhouse geyser box. Um, this is generally a more, um, let's say it it won't change the p-value of your main effect as much as the other uh, uh, adjustments. So with that respect, it's a little bit more conservative and it kind of keeps your error uh, or accepted error down a little bit more. But if this p-value was less than 0.05, we would say sphericity has been violated and then we would have to look at these adjustment factors. So that's where this portion of the table comes in. If you recall, we start at the greenhouse geyser box and then you would say if epsilon is less than or equal to 0.75, you use the greenhouse geyser adjustment. If it's greater than 0.75, you use the hewn felt adjustment. Okay, basically these epsilon values are, the, this one is honestly all you're actually evaluating. Is, does, is, is it 0.75 or greater or 0.75 or lower? Okay. Once you determine what adjustment you're using or if you have assumed sphericity, 
When you look at your test of within subjects effects, you can see there's a sphericity assumed row, a greenhouse geyser row, as well as a hewn felt row. In our case, because we assume sphericity, right, in this test of within subjects, which is our ANOVA table, therefore it's evaluating our differences between our means, we are going to follow, right, for our within subject um, variable that sphericity was assumed. And then this should look relatively familiar. You have the actual treatment sum of squares, the error sum of squares, the various degrees of freedom, as well as the mean square calculations, the F statistic, and then we have our um, p-value for that F statistic. Okay, so sphericity assumed, we're looking at the p-value in that row, which is identified as 0 .000, which we know means we have a p-value less than 0 .001. If this is the case, right, when we're evaluating our p-values, if p is greater than 0.05, you accept the null hypothesis and say that there would be no significant difference between the protocols. Right, But in our case, because p is less than 0 0.005, we reject the null hypothesis and say there's at least one significant difference between our protocols. Okay, They don't all have to be significantly different from each other. We just know there's at least one difference uh, in there. So this is when we would need to look at pairwise comparisons, which again are like many t-tests. So it's just saying are any two given variables significantly different from each other? Okay, so we go from test of within subjects and we scroll all the way down to pairwise comparisons. And like I said in the previous uh, output, right, you get these little asterisks next to significant mean differences. So similar to our t-test that we looked at last week, Right? When you have different pairs, the, the order that they are subtracted is the order that they show up in the table. So this is a negative mean difference, indicating that protocol 2 had a greater mean than protocol 1. And you can see that in the descriptive statistic box here. Okay, So um, this mean difference then has a p-value. Okay, And in this case, we have a significant pair in such that protocol 1 gives us a significantly different result than protocol 2 okay with a p-value less than 0 0.001 same goes for differences between protocols 1 and 3 okay um, but you'll notice there's not a significant difference between 2 and 3 so that's not a significant pair and when you look at these um, there is a lot of repetition in this table such that each pair is listed twice. So if we look at 1 and 2, right, this pairwise comparison would be protocol 1 minus the mean of protocol 2, which we see gives us a negative mean difference that is significant with a p-value less than 0 0.001. Well, we also can see that the same pair is indicated here, right, but in this uh, set up, we're looking at protocol 2 minus the mean of protocol 1, we still get the same mean difference, right? But again, because the order that the variables were listed has changed, we get a positive difference instead of a negative difference, still indicating that protocol 2 had the larger mean. Okay, but we also still get the same p value, right? So when you're listing significant pairs for um, either uh, an independent one-way ANOVA or you're listing significant pairs for a repeated measures ANOVA, you only have to list the pair once since there is some degree of repetition within the pairwise comparisons table. Okay, I have included some additional examples in this extra area. Um, and these will show up on the quiz, so I highly encourage you guys to try to riddle them out. Um, there are some hints given because the outputs 
uh, are included in the quiz. So when you're revisiting uh, your quiz questions uh, after your first attempt, if you decide that you want to run it again, you can always cross-check um, whatever output that you get with the output that is in the quiz to see if you actually ran the test correctly. Okay. So each of these scenarios should give you plenty of hints on how to uh, reorganize your data if that is necessary. And then it's all a copy paste into SPSS and then riddling out and following the flow charts to figure out what your p-values are, what values in the table are of importance to you, and then further uh, just practice on how to interpret those values. Okay. So if you have any questions on this, let me know.